Good afternoon in Europe. Good morning in US. And hey to the rest of the world. Um, thanks for coming to my talk about the uh, fine grained policies. Are back with NGAC. Um, as you can tell, I am not a native. So when I submitted this talk, um, the title was Fine Grinded Policies Are Back with NGAC. Right. So pun intended. Um, in this talk, we will talk about access policies and, and um, how deep we can go in, in terms of granularity. And uh, Spoiler alert, uh, why we cannot achieve that with the uh, RBAC. Before I continue, let me introduce myself. I'm Jose Carlos Chavez. I am a software engineer at the trade. Um, I participate in some open source projects uh, with lots of enthusiasm. I am a OWASP Corasa co leader, um, also a SIPKIN member. I am Peruvian, I am father of two. So, Let's start with this talk. Um, let's first define or, or let's have a notion about what access control is. According to Security 101 from Microsoft, access control is an essential element of security that determines who is allowed or not to access certain data, apps, but in general resources and under what circumstances, right? What, what the context is. Uh, basically, when we talk about uh, access control, we talk about a couple of cases, right? Uh, first of all, make an access decision. Um, you get a principal, you get an operation that the principal is trying to perform, and then you get a resource over which this operation is going to happen. And then there is a response which is uh, allow or deny, right? That's, that's the, the typical use case about access control. Um, in the other hand, in the in the administration or the managing part, we have the type of access policies that we have, um, the policy API, and what the language is, right? Whether it's a uh, rego policy, whether it's CDAR, or, or any other policy language. Um, but more and more, we are talking about more use cases, right? That are more related to audit, um, user comprehension of the policies and forensics. Um, so there are three more use cases that uh, are desirable in, in access control systems nowadays in the, in the cloud native um, landscape. One is uh, explain, which is basically I get this principle, uh, trying to perform this operation over this resource. What are the reasons for allow or deny this um, request? Also, what access does this principle holds? Like to what resources can this principle access, right? That's that's another one. And then we have who can who has access to certain resource. That's also an important one, right? Uh, based on that, you will say like, okay, if we talk about audits or, or forensics, like, okay, these and these and these principles or, or subjects have access to this resource. These are, these are the desirable use cases on top of the existing classical use cases of access control. But what are the models we have for access control? Well, we have a f some, some, some models, uh, but uh, the most common are, are, are four. And actually the, the, the ones that are most, most used nowadays are a couple, right? First, we have discretionary access control, which is um, that every owner has an object and then the, the owners uh, grant access um, access to the, to the to other users at their discretion, right? They basically ad hoc decide case by case by case, by, by case um, who can access to what resources or not, right? And since this is case by case and it's an ad hoc um, a scenario, is doesn't seem to be too scalable, right? Because then you will have lots of uh, owners versus lot of resources versus lot of potential holders of access. Um, but this is, for example, what you have in Google Docs um, when you give access to certain people, right? Then you have mandatory access control where users are granted access in the form of a clearance, right? There is a central authority that regulates access rights and, and then organize them in tires. 
uh, and it's this is very common in government and military context like for 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 example confidential information for secrets right where where structures are very static and rigid then there is probably the most common one which is RBAC role based access control this is if you ever use um Kubernetes, for example, but there are other tools that have been using RBAC for a while. Um, this is access rights based on uh, business functions, right? Or you can also think of them as roles, right? Rather than an individual identity. This is easy to understand and author policies in the right way because roles are kind of so descriptive, right? They have the semantics to explain what is this entitled to. So defining the policies is it's kind of natural, right? But then you can have some challenges when it comes to scaling this, right? You could have some role explosion, for example, when you need to give more granularity to access, then uh, basically people can get, a, or, or actually the setup can get messy because you will have lots of roles. The more granularity you're, you're looking for, the more roles you have to create, right? And then we have uh, ABAC, which is Attribute-Based Access Control just uh, uh, a natural evolution of our back right uh, uh, where the access is granted uh, flexibly based on a combination of attributes and environmental conditions right such as uh, time or location um, a good uh, real life example could be a passport right where you have a passport which has a set of attributes that describe you you could have nationality age um, then uh, you could have uh, date of birth, name of the parents, um, when, when is this document, um, is, what is the, 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 the valid date for this document, and so on. And then um, access decision can happen on, on these attributes, whether you are from one country or the other, whether you need a visa or not, whether you are under a certain age, so you need the permission from your parents to travel, whether... Um, the passport is valid or not, and you can get into the country. Uh, but also some environmental conditions come into play, right? For example, if we're in COVID, um, you could only travel back to your country of residence or maybe under uh, humanitarian circumstances, you can go to another country. Like these are environmental conditions not related to the attributes. Um, it's hard to understand. Basically, because you don't know the attributes on beforehand, as opposite to, to RBAC, for example, where you know the roles and the roles have the semantics to describe themselves. Um, it's hard to, um, uh, uh, let's say, authoring the policies rightly is uh, basically difficult because you need all this information some permissions overlap, so you don't have a concept of precedence or, or maybe you don't need even precedence. Uh, but it's easy to scale and model, right? And, and um, basically you can have unlimited number of, of um, attributes, theoretically, and then uh, basically putting attributes to identities is, is easier, right? If you know the attributes. So to overcome all these issues and to think about how could we implement different, um, let's say, models in the organization, uh, because you don't necessarily uh, can say this is better than the other. In certain circumstances, you need this. In certain circumstances, you need attribute-based, role-based, um, discretionary as, uh, access control-based. Like you're going to say, I... I it depends on the circumstances depends on your uh, what is the state of the world in your organization it depends on many many things so ideally you should be able to provide all of them or or be able to implement all of um, what is needed for you most of them in, under certain conditions and there is when ngac comes to the rescue right ngac stands for next generation access control Basically, in the cloud native uh, application landscape nowadays, uh, it has found different domains and, and it requires uh, different granularity levels uh, and precision in a specifying policy, uh, considering a large set of variables right, that you have in, 
in a deployment. Um, the policies that are based on, based on attributes the, um, are not creating type relationship to a specific identities, right? But instead of a class of identities. Um, and those values could change over time. So you need a, a certain degree of flexibility. Um, and, and this is what we aim to with uh, NGAC. Basically, uh, NGAC is, was created by NIST and it takes the approach of modeling access decision data as a directed acyclic graph, right? You have users uh, or subjects because users is uh, kind of a close concept, but uh, you can have more than that as we can see in the next slides. You have objects or resources and you have user attributes and object attributes. And then you have policy classes, right? Um, you can think of it as an opinionated implementation of ABAC, right? But we will see that it's much more than that. Um, first of all, as you can see in this graph, uh, we, we have been able to, to provide a model based on what is actually happening in my organization, right? Where we have Alice working for engineering and Bob working for HR. They all belong to the company. And then we have different resources classified in, under different groups, right? We have uh, um, we have the resume and the contract, which are documents, but are all, all with a certain, um, let's say, certain attribute of confidentiality. We, but they are also files that belong to certain folder, and that folder has certain uh, groups. Um, you can think of it as uh, when it comes to, for example, domain-driven design, that you have the same entity under different domains, per, uh, having different attributes, different um, interests in te from, from the user perspective, right? Uh, so here is the same. You modulate um, different documents as documents because of the content they have but also as actual physical files uh, that belong to different directories. And then having people being able to access under different permissions to those documents, right? Good thing about NGAC is that as you can see, you basically don't impose a model in your organization for writing permissions. Instead, you get your organization and put into the graph to, for, uh, to write the, the access policies. And then you can have different policies classes, right? Where, where you will describe which subject has access to what object. Um, let's go through the NGAC architecture. And basically you have a subject trying to perform an operation against a, an object. And then you will have a policy enforcement point, which is uh, basically the entry point to the resource or to the object. Um, the, the policy informant point it will be in charge of asking the policy decision point whether this uh, operation can be performed or not. At the same time, the policy decision point will ask the policy administration point for what are the policies uh, and what information do we have about this um, user and about this policy. And then the, the policy administration point will ask the policy information point for, for the information, as I said. And then it will come back with, with a certain information. So the policy administration point will go back to the policy decision point with all the information on the policy for, for it to make the decision. And it will read and send back the decision to the policy enforcement point saying allow or deny, right? And then uh, based on whether it's an allow or denied, if it's an allow, it will, the policy informant point will forward this to the uh, resource access point, uh, which will basically return in a allow position, will return this uh, resource or object to the subject, right? Then there is an isolated concept of uh, event processing point where different events are, are basically like an event loop are happening, right? Um, it could be that the, when there is an access decision, you communicate the, the event processing point to, to, to make a, a signal that something happened. For example, if you have a policy that is a one-time policy, then you could notify the event processing point uh, that this, this access already happened. So 
it can make some operations in the graph to maybe remove uh, a policy or it can be a, a policy related to the time. So then based on, a, on the even loop, it will say like, okay, this time passed. So the policy is no longer valid and will make a change in the graph. It's basically an even loop uh, that according to certain conditions, it will do changes in the, in the overall policy. Um, as you can see, uh, there is a natural fit. Uh, if we talk about Istio or service mesh, there is a natural field on this architecture into uh, Istio deployment, right? Where you ha will have a policy enforcement point inside uh, the Istio sidecar, which is an envoy. Um, the PDP, the policy, the, the policy decision point can be anything. It could be an X out uh, set uh, server. It could be a WASM plugin. It could be anything basically, as long as it makes the decision. Uh, remember the, the policy enforcement point is only for enforcing that there's going to be some scrutiny in this request. Then the decision is made at the PDP. And then the PAP, the PIP, they could be part of the same component or a different component that's up to the implementer to decide, right? Maybe you have the, let's say all the policies in memory in the PDP. So, um, so they don't need to be physically uh, separated, nor logic. Well, logically maybe, but not necessarily different components. Then the, the resource access point, um, I like to put it inside Envoy as well, because in the end, after the enforcement point related to NGAC happens, there are some other things that will that need to happen to get access to the to the actual resource. So yeah, the, the resource access point is is going to be part of the of the sidecar as well. Uh, but the title of this talk was "How Fine Grained um, Was This Policy Set or, or This uh, Policies Access Policy." C uh, model, right? Um, to that, let me show an example. Uh, like, let's say we start with a classic RBAC setup where we have Piotr and Lance working for an SRE uh, role, let's say, that belongs to the RBAC uh, policy. And then we have a backend service which has two instances. As you can see, there is this. Um, bridge, let's say, between SRE and backend, this this edge that uh, tells uh, the permissions that the, that the SRE, uh, let's say, subjects will have over this uh, backend resource, which is a service in the end. And then uh, this is one policy, but let's say we, we need another policy, right? That not necessarily are, are, are bug related. So we could have a location policy where uh, Lance belongs to the US team and uh, it's actually uh, in the US um, to the yeah, European yeah. team and it's based on the EU. Um, for, for the sake of uh, compliance or, or, or when we talk about um, compliance policies, uh, regulation that we have in, in, in the software world, um, we could say that this is relevant um, because where do you put your data in which services in which region, right? There might be some compliance requirement that, uh, let's say, a health company from the U.S. only wants to use um, U.S. Uh, cloud providers where, where the servers are physical in the U.S., right? Um, so, yeah, we, we put in place this policy. We need, we see that one instance is in uh, one instance of the backend services in the US, another instance of the backend services in the European Union, right? And then they all belong to the, to the location policy. Uh, but yet, not enough, we could have uh, another policy class, which we call topology, where we say, like, okay. The, the front end service can query the back end service and, and we don't have another policy, meaning that basically the, no other service could query the back end service. Um, we can see that uh, we have uh, this edge from front end to back end that uh, lists all permissions. Um, so that is in one hand, 
um, if we think about permissions in this, we could, if we're talking about gRPC, we could talk about methods, uh, but it could be list, the methods could be listed here if we, if we want to model them inside the, the NGAC policy, or it can be delegated to uh, an, another layer of security where the backend allows different methods depending on different conditions. That's entirely up to the user. Um, we basically modulate what we have in the graph and what we can put in the graph, right? So yeah, to summarize, we have three different policies, completely decoupled one from each other, but we have different nodes and that in, in, in the real life, they, they are arranged in this, in this way, right? So, so as you can see, we, we basically model what is happening in the real world into this graph. So how do we, do we make the access decisions? What is the whole point about the NGAC? Well, let's say we want to see whether LANs can access the instance one or not, right? And for that, we, we first need to, to traverse the graph to see whether LANs can access it. If, if there is any bridge between LANs or any attribute of LANs, and, and the instance one, right? Or any attribute of the instance one, for example, that it belongs to the backend, right? And we will see that, yeah, indeed, um, there is a bridge between the US, um, the US engineer zone and the US um, region uh, where the instances are hosted. Um, there are read, read permissions for that. And then we see that lands belongs to the US, US belongs to, or fills the, the location policy. And in the same, at the same time, the instance two belongs to the US, um, let's say the, the US zone. And then that zone belongs to, or, or plays also in the location policy. So from, from that point of view, we, need, we see that lands can access the instance two but we also have some, some other policies in place, right? That also need to be um, fulfilled, right? We, we see that LANS is part of the SRE team and the SRE team under the RBAC policy um, can access the backend and hence it can access the instance too. So in some, ah, and, 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 and for that we have uh, read and write permissions from SRE uh, team to the backend service. So in sum, what we will have is that according to the location policy, yes, LANs can access the instance two, the instance one, and according to the RBAC policy, yes, LANs can access the, the instance, instance one with read and write uh, permissions. And the conclusion is that yes, LANs can access instance one um, with, the, with the least privilege, right? Which in this case will be read. Um, but we can do even other kind of decisions, right? That don't involve necessarily users, uh, but uh, whatever that we can identify in this graph, right? Notice that uh, one of the, the, in the model of AG and NGAC, we also split the graph into two parts, the object DAG and the subject DAG, right? And uh, you can see that we have um, repeated nodes in one side and the other, depending whether I am the subject or the object, right? Um, in this case, we have that, uh, well, uh, you know already the decision, but let's, let's see what is the analysis behind that. Can instance four reach instance one? Well, um, according to the topology policy, we have that the front end can query uh, the backend service. Uh, there is a bridge here from front end to backend with all permissions. And it goes through the topology policy class because the instance one belongs to the backend uh, service. And then the backend service according to the topology class is connected to the front end service. But then according location, there is, there is no, um, let's say edge uh, between instance four and instance one, right? Because the instance one, when it comes to location, uh, it goes down to EU. And then uh, in from, from the instance uh, four standpoint, it's only connected to the US um, node 
in, in the graph uh, in the in the US, let's say in the US zone. So and the EU and the US don't have any any edge, right? If you see the US with the US are connected, the EU with the EU are connected, but EU with US are not connected. So uh, instance four cannot reach instance one. And then the decision is to deny this request. As you can see, you can modulate what is in place already in your world. Like you can think of it a Kubernetes deployment with policies for namespaces, access, cluster, cluster access, even multi-cloud access, right? Can this cloud reach this cloud? Can this namespace reach the external services or, or the cloud provider? Can this user access this resource? Whatever you can modulate in a graph, you can write policies for in, in NGAC, right? So overall, the benefits of, of NGAC are first, you can overlay access policies on top of an existing representation of the world provided by the user. You don't, so it's, it's, as I said, you put uh, your policies, you, you get your the state of the world, you put that into a graph and then you write the policies on top of that, which is natural instead of you modulate your reality based on the policies, which doesn't scale. Second, it scales linearly, roughly, depending on the user attributes, plus the object attributes, plus the associations, or the size of the subgraph after a trim uh, for the user and object in questions, right? This is especially uh, important because other, uh, let's say, models of access permissions or access policies are, um, when it comes to scaling, it becomes ex exponential computations. Um, even an early version of NGHC uh, scaled in a cubic way, in a polynomial way, but now um, it has been proved that it scales linearly. Um, another benefit is that it can be configured to allow or disallow access based not only on object attributes, but also on other conditions. For example, time, remember the EPP that we saw, um, which is uh, count, uh, or basically being aware of time, location, which we just shown, uh, and etc. right? Whatever attributes that you can, whatever condition that you can modulate in the EPP, and then you can put the objects around that or the subjects in a graph, you can write policies about, right? Um, it can evaluate and combine multiple policies while keeping its linear time complexity. Yeah, as you can see, we evaluated different policies. Um, and, and, and basically the algorithms for, for resolving the graphs, like the connectedness of the graph, it remained the same. Um, yeah. so, so yeah, basically you do all evaluation at once. You don't need to do different evaluation then reconcile the results. Um, then the audit to see what objects are affected by a policy is also possible traversing the graph. So basically uh, whenever you're gonna put a a policy in place, you can see on beforehand what are the, the objects that are affected by, by it. And then explain why a particular access was allowed, which is a key point about this. It's also very important because you will you will see that um, in, in other uh, access or in other access control uh, models, it's really hard to explain why a particular access was allowed, right? Because you have to resolve at that time um, all the conditions, and then you need to reconcile the conditions. So if we compare with other uh, NGAC models, it's also, um, again, I'm not saying that NGAC is better than our back or an A back or, or something like that. What I'm saying is that with the NGAC, you can achieve R back, which is needed, and A back, which is also needed, right? Um, a back as a pro, it provides flexibility, of course, because you can uh, basically the model can scale um, unlimitedly, right? Because you, you can create as much attributes as you want. The cons are that performance and auditability can be problematic because of the number of attributes. And also those attributes are not carrying information about the capabilities are not necessarily easily related to the capabilities, right? And also you have to combine them, um, which can be problematic in computationally talking. Uh, as I mentioned, as opposite as in the roles where you, where the role is more or less identified with the, 
with the capability. That's much more um, natural, right? Our bag is simple, but you have, uh, and it's easy to digest, to understand, and, and it's easy to write policies on. But then you have the role explosion because the more granularity you need, the more roles you you need. And also, someone was saying in the in the chat that. Uh, for for our bag, you need roles for everything, which doesn't happen in the real life, right? You, ad hoc things cannot be done, and in real life, what you have is ad hoc policies. You have role explosion because the more granularity you need, the more roles you create, and that's not scalable. You have fixes fixed access rights because you need to know the the roles on beforehand, um, and then there are challenges meeting regulatory requirements due to ability because. Uh, as I said, uh, in zero trust um, model, what you have is that uh, you will need to give um, a lot of granularity to your permissions because you have the the minimum permission or the minimum access granting to the to the objects, and then um, it's hard to come up with a general policy that that is um, that was for everyone. Right. Um, you see high level of granularity. We are running out of time. Uh, auditability, as we saw, flexibility. You can combine access policies, which is very important. And on early stage, it needs more high level APIs to help uh, users to maintain the graph because it's, it's not trivial. You need to reconcile the reality with your graph. So you need tooling for that. Finally, conclusions. Uh, ABAC is a natural fit for the class of cloud native applications because uh, in, a, in a microservices world, you need teams to give um, independence, and then they they need to be able to create their own attributes. They don't need to, they, they, they cannot just uh, work with the, what is created by the by the security team. They, they need flexibility, and for that attributes work great. Also, it um, empowers them to create their own policies, and it's flexible enough. Um, being able to understand an access decision in a human readable way is crucial to understand access leaks and secure points and forensic research. And performance is a, is a key in access decision as making decisions in the critical path, which happens in this point because every request goes through the policy enforcement point, could have a huge impact in latency. These are the reference for the talk. Thank you everyone for coming and enjoy the conference. If you have any question, I will be around in the Slack or also in the chat for the, for the session. Thank you so much.